Welcome back, CFP. I said, welcome back, CFP. <laughs> Thank you. Been a little bit buttoned down up to now. Ed Hasbrook not wearing tie dye. <laughs> we'll look for we'll look for him to wear it tomorrow. He says. Um, CFP is a is a very special conference to me, and as good an illustration as any is the fact that you can have a panel entitled "Do Not Track Yay or Boo." Uh, thank you to the to the organizers of CFP this year, particularly Lily. Uh, for lots of work. I saw lots of emails and hours of the emails were distinctive as well. All hours of the day and night. And Jules Polonetsky as well, for what he's done to put this thing together. Thank you for being here. Thanks to all my panelists. We are going to do a modified debate here. Uh, the title, Yay or Boo, is really, if there's a serious point to it, it's to mock the kinds of debates that we have in Washington, D.C. They tend to be highly partisan, very uninformed, uh, they have the characteristic of children fighting in the sandbox. Yay! <laughs> but, but the actors act very self-important. And, and uh, what we're going to do, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and switch that up, and we're going to embrace a stupidly partisan tone. Is anyone in favor of that? Yay! Who's against it? Nobody. Good answer. We're going to embrace a stupidly partisan tone. Uh, abandon the, the, the pretense of self-importance, and hopefully the converse will result, which is an informative discussion that gets everybody better, uh, better aware of, of Do Not Track, what it is, how it works, what it's about, should we have it or not. Uh, a loose agenda is we're going to get to, uh, we're going to talk about how we got to the Do Not Track proposal, talk about Do Not Track as a technical matter, uh, what has to happen for Do Not Track to work, uh, and then the real, the real heart of the issue is uh, why? How are we better off with Do Not Track? I have seated our panelists in a way consistent with the formation of this debate. On my left, and of course they would be on the left, <laughs> is the Yay team. Do Not Track Yay. Let's hear it for them. Yay! I'm not setting up well for my comments. <laughs> On my right, the uh, Koch-funded corporate force, uh, <laughs> opposition to Do Not Track, in a, in a way. Let's hear it for them. <laughs> you, have, uh, you have the bios in front of you. I don't need to explain who everybody is, but I'll go from left to right. Chris Segoyan, Harlan Yu, Ed Felton, I'm Jim Harper, Zandy Ziegler, Baron Soka, Ryan Radia. Uh, Ed works for the Federal Trade Commission, so he will now deliver the obligatory, uh, I work for the government and I'm not saying what the government thinks. I work for the government and I'm not saying what the government thinks. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> so, so, yay team. And we'll hear from the and we'll hear from boot team as well. Uh, how did we get to where we are? Why is do not track an important proposal? Uh, what's been going on up to now in terms of controlling the internet advertising industry's access to information to people excessively much? So, Chris, go. So I, I'm not going to go into how companies track you online. That's a, a larger issue. But I will say that many responsible companies have offered consumers a means to opt out of online tracking. Uh, for the last several years, this has been effectuated through an opt-out cookie that a consumer gets uh, from an advertising network's website. There are hundreds of advertising networks that offer opt-out cookies, and so uh, in addition to that, there were uh, industry organizations like the Network Advertising Initiative that tried to offer a one-stop shop to consumers. You could go to the NAI website, click Select All, and get some opt-outs. The problem there is that there are only uh, a few members of the NAI, and so there were still hundreds of opt-out cookies that you would have to get elsewhere on the web. And so actually, two years ago, uh, at CFP in, in DC, um, uh, I guess in 2009, I had just released uh, a plugin for the Firefox web browser called Taco that tried to pull a bunch of these opt-out cookies together into one place. Taco was a, you know, an interesting proof of concept. Uh, as it, the, the goal was to sort of show how difficult the industry had built the, the current system, right? Ad companies wanted to offer an opt-out so they could go before regulators and say, we have delivered consumers a means to, 
to, to use choice or to, to get choice, but they didn't actually want it to be that easy to use. Wait a second, wait a second. Chris, is that true? I mean, is that, is that really true? Does everyone agree that that's why the network advertisers did that? Was because they wanted to have something to say, or did they actually want to protect privacy? Blue side? I mean, Are they I, being ingenuine when, well, they, when they put this together? Within a year of Taco coming out, suddenly the network advertising initiative had their own clone of Taco. Google has their own opt-out tool that lets you get a bunch of opt-out cookies. So you know, it wasn't a you know it wasn't an, an amazing concept. It was something that was thrown together over a weekend. Well, Jim, Jim, if I may here, I, I think it's a mistake to focus on intention. I mean, the fact is that Chris did something good. Uh, this is part of when we talk about self-regulation, we don't just mean you know industry people getting together and being angelic and doing good things for consumers. We mean a very complicated mess of things that happen, including annoying people like Chris who do things that I think in many ways are very good, right? So shaming companies and calling them compliment. bad privacy practices <laughs> is, is part of the, the process that I think we see as an alternative to heavy-handed regulation. And that includes going out and, and building tools just like the one that, that Chris built. And Chris is gonna, gonna roll his eyes here when I say this, but you know, we at the same time, when I was at the Progress and Freedom Foundation with our complete lack of technical skills, basically tried to do something similar to what Chris did, building upon Google's persistent opt-out uh, plugin. And Chris did it far, far better and got it adopted. And I see that as a success. So I, I don't think it's really worth sitting around thinking, well, would they have done this if Chris hadn't uh, lit a fire under them? Because Chris did. And that's part of the, the process that I see working here. You see how, as your moderator, I'm trying to engender the, the debate that we're really looking for. Um, Chris, you're a market actor whether you want to be or not. Ha ha. But continue. <laughs> All right, so I'm glad that Baron at least recognized that the, the taco style um, uh, cookie options or cookie tools were a, a move in the right direction, but clearly not a sufficient um, uh, not a sufficient solution. So uh, ad networks track people via cookies. They track people via flash cookies. Some have been using other techniques such as uh, browser history sniffing, fingerprinting most recently. And in some cases, with those other technologies, there are ways for consumers to opt out. In some cases, there are no means for consumers to opt out. And so the latest technique that ad companies use to track consumers uh, is called browser fingerprinting. This is a way of detecting uh, which computer has visited your site based on unique differences in that browser, which fonts have you installed on your system, in which order have you installed those fonts, which plugins, which versions of plugins, and that kind of thing. And it's important to, that, to know that none of the existing privacy controls in the browser, clearing your cookies, clearing your cache, um, deleting your browsing history, none of those things will address browser fingerprinting. And so one of the main reasons that the folks at this table and, and others in this room you know, really sort of uh, gathered around and, and, and embraced the idea of the do not track header, which is something that's now built into three of the four browsers, I wish Google would add it to, to theirs, um, is that it finally allows you to say no to all tracking you know, regardless of which technology is being used to track you, whether it's cookies, whether it's flash cookies, whether it's cache, whether it's uh, browser history, whether it's fingerprint based, this is a single method by which consumers can tell ad companies they don't want to be tracked. Let me, let me interrupt you there, Chris, because I want to hear from uh, Ryan Radia, who's written some about various measures people can take to protect themselves. Ryan, you've written on the Tech Liberation Front blog recently about some things. What are other things? What's, what are the variety of behaviors, activities, things that people can do to protect themselves from tracking various ways, even if they're not a complete solution? There are lots of technologies that lots of people use. For instance, Firefox add-ons like NoScript and AdBlock can reduce tracking. But there are no silver bullets. The technologies that are necessary to prevent you from being tracked online are imperfect. But that's because there is a huge incentive to use your information for a variety of ways, both beneficial and in some cases harmful. The problem with do not track, and the browser fingerprinting is an excellent example of this, is that it doesn't actually prevent anyone from tracking the fingerprint of your browser except for a very limited subset of actors, third party networks, and except for third parties that use your information for analytics purposes. All right, we're gonna go back. Could, can I just make a point of clarification? Sure, I, sure. I just wanna make sure everyone, this is not a, a, an argument, but everyone here understands that really, uh, this is not about tracking, it's about use specification. In other words, do not track is, do not collect my data for certain purposes. And I think, it, I think we'll have a better conversation if we're all clear on that, and the technologists can probably explain that better than I can. Yeah, and I do want to get to the sort of the, the meat of, of exactly what Do Not Track is supposed to do, but the way we've come to this is everybody is saying, stop tracking. 
Well, we do have to figure out what that is. But one of the grown-ups in the room, Ed Felton, has asked to speak. Ed? Actually, I wanted to ask Andy to speak because you guys, have, Microsoft has a technology that uh, um, that is effective in giving consumers choice, right? Right. So I thought I was the moderator. <laughs> Andy? I'm about to invite him over to our side. <laughs> I'd, I'd happily join. Um, so tracking protection is a feature in Internet Explorer that's similar to, uh, it's a do not track feature, essentially, but uh, the primary difference is that instead of sending a header to websites, which is kind of like a signal of intent that says, I don't want to be tracked, tracking protection actually enforces uh, the user's choice. So as everybody knows, websites are connected, uh, they have links, they have embedded content. A lot of that content's great, and it provides a lot of the innovative experiences that are on the web, like maps and advertisements, images, lots of things. But there's a privacy and a security impact including that content in your website. So when you go to, for instance, wallstreetjournal.com, your address bar says wallstreetjournal.com, but you're, you're really including content from you know, tens to hundreds of, of different websites. And every time you do that, you share a little bit of information. Can I, can I ask you to flesh that out? Lots of people, especially up on this panel, already know how all that stuff works. Can you tell us, just for the people who aren't sophisticated about internet protocol and browsers, what's going on? Third party material on websites, what's, what's happening? So everybody's familiar with the concept that a web page has links and that there's hypertext, and that's how the World Wide Web got popular. Um, but it's a little less obvious when you go to a website that it's actually, you go to a page, you get the page like from Wall Street Journal, but that page says, hey, get this content from all these other different websites. And that's, that's super powerful. It means that if you want to see, for instance, a Google map on a website that's not Google, you can have that map embedded right in your page. Um, but that, that process kind of happens automatically. So when you go to a page, you know, it, it doesn't say, hey, user, can, is it okay if we go to contact all these different websites? It just automatically happens. Um, so what tracking protection does is allows users uh, to get something. I'll, I'll, I want to take it just a little bit further. When all those websites see you visiting uh, lots of different places, Facebook is one, it might be Google that has, um, has code on a lot of different websites. They get insight into your travels on the web that's much more broad than any one website. So that's uh, an important sense of tracking that, that people work on protecting. So sorry, please continue. Right, that's a great point. And you know, as Chris mentioned, uh, you know, there's a variety of different techniques that that are used to, to track you. Um, but the, the core issue is that you know when you go to Wall Street Journal and you go to Blockbuster and then you go to the New York Times, if all those websites include the same content from the same third party. Um, then they have like a line of sight into the fact that you've gone to these different places. Um, so, so tracking protection lets users get stuff, uh, get tracking protection lists. Um, so these are things that anybody can write, any privacy advocate, anybody in this room. Um, if you don't want to write one, you can encourage somebody else to write one or you can share a link to one. After a user has one, uh, when you go to a website, all the third party content in the page is filtered against the user's tracking protection lists. And if the tracking protection list says, hey, you know, I don't include this content from this third party site because it's tracking content, uh, then Internet Explorer will just not load that content. So regardless of the specific tracking mechanism used, whether it's cookies or e-tag, cache header things, or you know, the not the click style thing, it doesn't matter because the network request isn't actually going to the third party. Jim, if I can just make another point of clarification here, the way I think about this is that it's essentially a do not load mechanism. And it is in some sense similar to the way that, uh, as Ryan was saying, that Adblock Plus works, where you have whitelists and blacklists that tell your browser what to load and what not to load, and those can include um, tracking elements. And so it's in that indirect way that this is a do not track mechanism. 